I'm going to be talking about Schrodinger's website. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept of Schrodinger's cat, it basically says if you put a cat inside of a box, a completely enclosed box with um, some poison that's going to be released in an indeterminate amount of time, you cannot possibly know if the cat is dead or alive or both at the same time without being able to observe the cat. So before I get into how that's relevant to this talk, I'm going to go real quick through the normal web development life cycle. So typically, you start off with a designer who has an idea for a new marketing page or a feature or whatever. They sit down at Photoshop, Sketch, whatever their app of choice is. They build some beautiful designs, put all the pixels in the right spot, make it very pretty. Uh, then they pass it off to the developer who looks at the designs, sits down at the computer, starts building out all the code to bring these designs to life. After that, you might pass it off to your QA team. They'll open it up in the browser, click around, make sure nothing's broken, probably resize their browser a bunch of times, make sure all the breakpoints look correct. And then once that's all good, everything's good on the website, you hit the button, you launch your website out into the world, and you're done. So it's a pretty typical process for building a website. Um, but now I'm going to talk about why and how we have to do things a little bit differently for our product, Adobe Portfolio. So what Portfolio is, is it's a what you see is what you get or WYSIWYG website builder with a fully visual graphic user interface for making customizations. Uh, you can tell by the name it's intended for displaying creative work, mainly visual work for creatives. Uh, and what we do is we start you off with a choice of eight different layouts to begin with. Uh, all of which are automatically responsive. So the sites are fluid out of the box, but the idea is that the end user doesn't have control over the responsive size and versions of their website. Uh, it would really complicate the editing process, and plus our demographic is largely non-technical, and having to think about how to build a responsive website is actually pretty challenging if you're not a web developer or web designer. So, The big thing with this product is that the user writes no code whatsoever. All of the changes are made a GUI, uh, there's tons of options. You can change how many columns you have, you can change the spacing, you can change your font sizes, line heights, colors, alignment, you can turn things on and off, you can move things around your page, you can change the width of things, you can add different content types, you can upload images, crop them, change their aspect ratios, and even still this is not even beginning to scratch the surface of all of the different customization dialogues that appear in this app. So there's a ton that you can do with it. So what this means for us as the developers of this product is that we can get specs for a layout from our designers, and we can build the layout to that spec, but then when we hand it off to the user to use the product, we have no idea what they're going to change about this website. And this is what I mean when I say Schrodinger's website. We can build the layout that our designers designed, but we have no idea yet what the end user is going to design themselves and what they're going to actually do with it. So some of the challenges that we had with this. Um, customizations that you see in the editor, of course, have to be 100% accurate, representative of what you get on your finish, final published website. You don't want any surprises there. Uh, everything must be user customizable. We really want people to be able to you know, instill their ideas and their own personal branding and style in their website. Of course, minus the responsive part, because we're trying to keep it simple for them. Uh, and, of course, the responsive styles then must look good for an infinite possible set of customizations because we have no idea what the user will actually end up doing. So uh, the challenges that we have as far as markup and CSS goes, of course, we said editor and final publish site uh, need to be identical. What we went with here is mustache for uh, the markup rendering. Uh, if we... It, it's convenient because there's renderers for mustache in multiple different languages, so we were able to use it for JavaScript on the client side and for our PHP rendering backend. If we were going to do this today, or maybe even still we will, we would probably use something like Viewer React, which has a single rendering engine for the client and the backend, as opposed to having different implementations like mustache does. Uh, we store all of the user customizations in a giant JSON object, which is great because obviously the client side can handle that pretty easily, but we're also able to use that on the back end as well. So for the styles, we wrote our own custom client side CSS processor called Fox. I don't actually know what it stands for, but it's probably not relevant. Um, 
And what Fox does is it actually watches the JSON object of t user customizations, waits for a change, and then changes the relevant CSS role so that the user can see their changes happening in real time. And the good thing about this also is that we can pipe that same JSON object into our SAS files, which are then what gets compiled to the final CSS that's served on the published site. So this is just an example of what a little bit of the JSON object of user customizations look like. You can see it's pretty standard things, font sizes, line heights, colors, some padding, things like that. Of course, the JavaScript can easily manipulate this data. Uh, we can easily use this data then to have CSS changes. Uh, it really is just the perfect data format for all parts of the stack. So what our Fox language ends up looking like is sort of the strange mashup between CSS and JavaScript. Uh, like I was saying before, our Fox processor waits for any one of these properties in the JSON to change and then just quickly swaps out that rule in the browser for super fast, real-time change uh, viewing. And then fortunately, that JSON object looks an awful lot like a SAS map. So we can do a really quick conversion uh, and then now our SAS, which generates styles for the final publish site, has access to every single bit of customizations that the user has decided to make. And in our SAS, there's a built-in SAS um, map functionality that lets you access map data. Um, out of the box, it only goes one level deep, so we have a really simple custom one that just lets you traverse a little bit deeper into the map. And then every user customizable CSS property just calls our map me function to actually retrieve the data. And the good thing about this too is then we also have the additional power of SAS if we want to use any like color manipulation or anything like that on the user's data, we can do that really easily. And then of course, what you end up with is completely normal looking CSS that we can minify and serve up on the final website. And then jumping back to the markup side of things, when we pipe our JSON into that, uh, it's really convenient for responsive images. We want to make sure that we're not serving up too big or too small of images uh, at the different breakpoints. And the fun thing here is that we can actually store our breakpoint values in our JSON object. So then both the mustache and the SAS and the CSS all across the board are looking at one single point for the breakpoint values. So when we want to change one, we don't have to remember to go into the SAS and go into the markup we only have to change it in one place. So now that we have all of the data in our access to it in our markup and in our styles, how do we actually think about making a website responsive when we only have the desktop version and only barely have the desktop version because we still don't really know what the user's done with it? So one of our big thinking points here is uh, considering vertical rhythm. So what I mean when I say vertical rhythm is that it's the concept of vertical spacing and sizing to delineate blocks of content, uh, make things more cohesive, easier to read, uh, and creates a specific flow of the content through your page. Uh, so here's an example of one. Uh, you can see the website at the desktop size and then two smaller mobile sizes. The font size gets smaller, the spacing gets smaller, the images get smaller, but you can tell that it maintains the same vertical rhythm. It's obviously still the same website, it has the same feel, but it fits each browser size better. So there's tons of methods out there for establishing a system of vertical rhythm. Um, modular scale is a very popular one, there's a lot of them out there. And of course, having a system for these things makes it easier to apply the rules at a different breakpoint when there are rules to actually apply. But of course, it's impossible to establish a system when we have no idea what the user has done and probably isn't following one whatsoever. They could have changed their font sizes, line heights, and spacing to anything. So it's our job as the developer of this product is to actually kind of try and preempt any of the decisions that they might make with a system that could work for anything. So what can we actually do with this? Um, first, simple one right off the bat, uh, horizontal margins and widths, anything in that direction should be a re relative unit. That makes it fluid. This is good practice in general. Um, 
we can decide on minimum and maximum limits for vertical spacing and font sizes. Uh, if something is tremendous on the desktop, we probably want to still let it be big at a smaller breakpoint, but maybe cap it at something that we think probably makes sense. Uh, one gotcha here is that all of our font sizes and margins and uh, padding are measured in pixels rather than M or REM, which might be more popular because it needs to make sense to our end users and pixels are the most approachable unit for this. So that's something that we had to really work around. And then of course we need to scale cont content relevant to its related content as opposed to doing anything too independently and creating, throwing that vertical rhythm out of whack. So our first attempt here was actually this kind of crazy looking formula that I'll be honest, I don't really totally understand. It's the result of a lot of fidgeting. But the idea was basically that we could set a lower limit and an upper limit, scale any value in between that within that range, or anything outside of that range would have to be constrained to it. So let's say you, if our upper limit was 50 pixels for a font size and the user had chosen 100 pixels, we would cut that off at 50 pixels. Uh, same for extremely small font sizes. If they chose something extremely small, we would help them out at a smaller breakpoint by actually scaling it up to a minimum of 14. So the way we actually put that into practice then is that we can write a custom SAS function that actually has this function in it. It takes the user's font size and the minimum and maximum that we've decided makes sense for that area of their website. And then in the SAS, everywhere that is a, a user customized CSS property, again, just gets passed through that function and printed out. And then what we end up with at the end of this is actually the SAS has calculated all of the responsive font sizes and spacing for us and effectively made the website responsive. Um, so some things that we could do differently in the future if we were building this product today. Um, that responsive scaling formula is kind of nuts, and like I said, I made it and I barely understand it. So one thing that could be a little more interesting is actually doing fluid sizing um, with native CSS and CSS locks. So what I mean when I say that is, this is a technique for actually using viewport relative uh, font sizes using the native calc functionality, um, uh, rather than generating static numbers with SAS. Um, you would have breakpoint controlled minimum and maximum values, and then anything in between those breakpoints would scale relative to the browser. So here's a slightly nicer looking graph. What it's basically saying is that if your browser is below 320 pixels, have a minimum font size of 20. If your browser is above 960 pixels wide, cap out at 40 pixels, and then anything in between those two scale the font size relative to whatever the dimensions of the browser are. And in the CSS, this ends up looking much nicer. So we have our native calc function, we've passed our much simpler linear function into it, and then you just have totally normal looking breakpoints that say, if it's below 320, use 20 pixel font size. If it's above 960, use 40 pixel font size. And here's what that actually ends up looking like in the browser where when you shrink it or make it bigger, the font size scales, but you've maintained the vertical rhythm, you've maintained a relative font size to the content, so everything still makes sense and looks the way it was originally intended by the designer. Um, another cool thing that we can start to play with is uh, CSS custom properties or variables. So uh, the fun thing about these is that they are uh, aware of the context of the page, unlike a SAS variable that is completely static. Um, they also can be modified by JavaScript, which ends up making this a very compelling use case for our on-the-fly client-side editing instead of perhaps the uh, proprietary Fox system that we made up. So we can actually do some pretty cool stuff here. To start on the client side, we can set up the CSS to use properties so we end up having real CSS rather than our crazy mashup fox syntax that we created, that we saw earlier. Uh, and then we can let the JavaScript still wait for changes on that JSON data object and then just use the native interface to set the property that's being changed. 
on the back end side of things where the site actually gets published, we can use the same CSS from the client side since it's just using native CSS variables. Um, we can still use SAS to populate the values of those variables so that we can still get access to the user's JSON object. And then in the breakpoints, what that means is that we can use our custom range function or calc function or whatever it may be to redefine the value of the CSS variable rather than actually writing the CSS properties again and printing out new values. And this will actually, when you resize your browser down to that breakpoint, that variable, that CSS variable value takes effect. It's pretty cool. There are some drawbacks to CSS variables, unfortunately. Uh, for example, you can't use them in a selector like this, even though that would be extremely convenient. Uh, as with all good things in web development, we must consider browser support. So this is actually pretty phenomenal browser support, all things considered. Um, unfortunately, for our specific use case, we did decide that uh, the final published website should be supported in IE 11. We don't know who people are sending their portfolio websites to, so we're trying to do right by them. But it does still make it pretty potentially useful for our client-side editing, which does not support IE 11. Um, but yeah, that's like pretty good coverage. So there's a lot of potential with CSS variables, and you can probably go forth and start using them today. So that's pretty much how we uh, made websites make themselves responsive, and who knows, maybe someday artificial intelligence will just be doing all of our responsive websites for us. <laughs>